Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's a privilege to welcome you to this year's academic year's first endowed lecture, the William R. Stewart Memorial Lecture for Labor and Employment Law. Um, one of these reasons why these endowed lectures are so important is that it gives us an opportunity to reflect on and remember some of the great alumni that have graduated from this school, and that's certainly true in honoring Bill Stewart, a veteran of the U.S. Army. Uh, he earned his JD here in 1959. Forty years later, he was inducted into the school's Academy of Law Alumni Fellows. You can see his picture against the wall in the main hallway. That is the highest honor that we can award one of our graduates. Um, for 34 years, he was a lawyer for the National Labor Relations Board and was the board's first African-American chief counsel. His leadership and commitment to excellence prompted President Bill Clinton to award him the President's Award for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service and to characterize his contributions to the NLRB as unparalleled. At the time, he was the first and only NLRB employee in its entire 69-year history to receive this honor the highest honor the president can award any civil servant. Uh, past Stewart lectures have been some of the most prominent labor and employment lawyers in the nation and scholars. They include uh, Bill Gold um, from Stanford, Laura Cooper from Minnesota, Matt Finken from Illinois, and last year, Sam Bagansos from Michigan Law. Um, before we begin, special thanks to uh, Professor Dow Schmidt, Professor Widas, and Dean Brothman for helping with the organization of this event. This year, we're incredibly pleased to continue this grand tradition of bringing in great speakers to honor uh, Bill Stewart's legacy um, by having Professor Cynthia Esland join us to give this year's lecture. Uh, Professor Esland is the Catherine Ride Professor of Law at uh, New York University School of Law and one of the nation's leading labor and employment scholars. Uh, prolific, she's written a number of books focused on the workplace and pu published dozens of articles exploring democracy uh, procedural fairness, freedom of speech, and transnational labor rights and regulation. She graduated summa cum laude from Lawrence University and earned her JD at Yale Law School. A little bit of trivia, she attended Yale at the same time as Professor Lawn and Professor Johnson. I understand as a classmate of Judge David Hamilton's, I'm hoping you'll change your talk and give us lots of scoop back then. Um, <laughs> But today she is going to be talking about a new deal for China workers, the title of her recent book published by Harvard University Press. I hope you'll join me in welcoming this year's Stuart Lecturer, Professor Cynthia. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's my first time to Bloomington, but it has a familiar feel to it because um, my uh, labor law teacher, my uh, former colleague and dear friend Jack Getman started here and always speaks very, very fondly of it. It has a very a positive glow in my view. Um, and I'm also a Midwesterner, so. Um, so starting with Jack's labor law course in 1981, <laughs> Uh, my entire professional career, starting um, after law school uh, in practice and then in the academy, has been on U.S. labor and employment law with some limited forays into comparative uh, work, mostly safe places like Canada and the U.K. and a little in Europe until um, 2009. Until then, China wasn't really on my academic radar screen. Um, it was uh, arguably the global economic story of our lifetime. Um, Where's Michael? Here it is. Uh, so uh, we are familiar with this kind of GDP curve uh, starting in 1976. So you can trace from 1952, shortly after the revolution, going through the era of the planned economy, lots of political turmoil, and then 1978 or so, where that line is farm privatization, that's the reform and opening period, and things start taking off, and we're all familiar with that. Um, there's also, though, been a, a story of increasing inequality, the Gini Index being the um, sort of go-to guide for uh, comparing economic inequality across countries. China's gone from being one of the um, least unequal countries in the world to being one of the most unequal countries in the world. Uh, but there has been wage growth. Um, this is real uh, wage growth, taking into account inflation. Um, uh, over the course of uh, 25 years or so, it has um, increased by a factor of 10. That is 1,000%, if I have my numbers right. Um, and that's been accompanied by, ex you know, as you might expect, increases in life expectancy um, and huge reductions in poverty. So uh, 
this is a little hard to interpret, but it, China actually accounts, as you can see by comparing these two um, diagrams, China accounts for the great bulk of reduction in poverty across the world since 1981. So that very impressive global accomplishment is very substantially due to China. Um, China obviously loomed over the U.S. labor and employment um, scene. Uh, it was the geographic uh, location of the race to the bottom that was devastating the uh, terms, the, the wages and uh, employment for uh, U.S. industrial workers. Still, as an object of study, it just seemed too far, too foreign, um, too hard to understand until my first trip in 2009, and that was just a mid-career jolt of intellectual energy. The excitement of seeing labor issues on the front burner, something we hadn't seen in the U.S. for quite some time, um, and real change going on, some of it very encouraging. Um, so with encouragement from um, some uh, wonderful senior colleagues at um, uh, NYU, and with a lot of resources uh, from NYU, I dove in. Um, piles of reading, obviously, 13 trips so far, hundreds of conversations with academics and labor activists and government officials, etc., cetera, um, and uh, a at least temporarily aborted but fairly intensive study of Chinese. Um, <laughs> Uh, but all that has culminated in um, this book. This, so the reason you saw my name twice and the opening slide is because this is the cover of my book, which is actually forthcoming in December from Harvard University Press. Um, and it aims to make comparative uh, sense of China's labor scene and of the larger political economic context from a U.S. perspective. Um, so to begin with, um, China's economic progress has led me to see not so much a race to the bottom as a race to the rising bottom. This is something, you, you know, you're not going to be able to take in probably um, if you haven't seen it before. Um, it's called the elephant curve. Um, this arrays the entire world population by percentiles. So from the poorest people in the poorest countries to the richest people in the richest countries. Um, and what you see basically is that the flow of capital to poor developing countries, like China especially, has been, although devastating to um, blue-collar industrial workers in the developed market economy, especially in the U.S., um, it has been a huge gain for global justice and re sheer reduction in economic misery. Um, so China's migrant workers flooded into those hellish sweatshops that we know about because it was better than the alternative. It was better than the rural destitution that they were facing um, before that. Um, so that that is the only part of the curve that's experienced downward, uh, so reverse growth. And that's basically where the middle class and, and working classes of the, in, of the advanced countries of the world are located. Everyone below that, almost everyone below that, and everybody above that has experienced fairly significant growth. Um, okay, so uh, where are China and its workers headed besides having entered and expanded the global industrial workforce? Um, so uh, I could not help but view this uh, labor scene initially through the lens of um, U.S. experience and the New Deal in particular. Um, that's the cauldron in which our labor laws, our basic frameworks were formed. Um, you have a growth of uh, mass manufacturing, which unsurprisingly generates growing um, discontent and unrest on the part of labor, um, and that leads to rising worker demands, conflict, um, unrest. Um, that generates, in turn, serious concerns about industrial peace and even political stability, as happened in the U.S. in the 1930s. Um, uh, and that puts pressure on any government for reform, for something to address those concerns. So um, this is uh, the rising number of mass incidents. The data is really not good, and, and the official data, they've stopped publishing the official count of mass in incidents. These are estimates, and um, the estimates suggest that about a third of these are labor-related. So it's 280,000 mass incidents, um, some of which are pretty serious, some of which are smaller. Um, You've also seen what has to qualify as the largest union organizing drive in the history of the world, and that's by the um, All-China Federation of Trade Unions. Um, 
beginning in the early 2000s when they decided, yet, yes, those, mass, those migrant workers were part of the working class and part of our constituency and set out to organize. Uh, they set out with the goal of 100% of the Fortune 500 companies operating in China, and they've come pretty close to that. Um, and then in 2007... Well, you can look at this while I'm talking about what happened in 2007. Uh, major legislation, three major pieces of legislation that tried to um, raise labor standards, increase workers' access to legal remedies, especially for uh, wage arrears. That is, they didn't pay you at all. That's one of the biggest, still one of the biggest sources of labor unrest. Um, and so uh, clearly that unrest was having uh, an impact. Um, then came the Honda strikes in 2010, and that's what this is from. Um, over 4,000 workers in uh, four uh, component factories, and it rippled through the rest of the, uh, um, the, the supply chain within China. Um, 25 factories stalled the whole Guangdong uh, auto industry for some period of time. Uh, this was alarming because these were relatively productive workers in an advanced sector of the economy. Um, in an enterprise that was relatively compliant with the laws on the books, which are better than you would expect them to be. And they were not asking for um, uh, fulfillment of the promises that their employers or the law had made them. They wanted more. They wanted what they thought they deserved. Uh, uh, that is not something that a regulatory strategy, raising minimum labor standards, increasing access to legal remedies, is ever going to solve. Um, and so um, uh, this was, uh, it's, it seemed possible, all of a sudden there was this upsurge of discussion about collective labor relations. Um, and it seemed possible that China's workers were on the verge of a kind of breakthrough, a New Deal-like breakthrough in uh, law reform, labor standards, collective labor relations. But then one notices how different things are there. Um, uh, this is a matter between late, this is within the midst of the Honda strikes. Uh, what have you done, union official, to help the workers address their concerns about higher wages? This is a matter between labor and employers. It's inappropriate for the trade union to intervene. So um, I'm still torn between um, Alice and Dorothy. Have I gone through the looking glass or like Dorothy and Toto, am I just not in Kansas anymore? So. This is just something that uh, gripped me um, uh, and requires us to take a quick look at the All-China Federation of Trade Unions because it's a central character in this story. Um, it is uh, controlled, so those bold arrows are meant to be the dominant mechanism con control. It's controlled at every level down to the enterprise by um, the corresponding chapter of the Communist Party of China. That's who appoints the officials. That's who decides their policies. That's who oversees them. That's who decides whether they're going to be promoted. Um, at the enterprise level, um, that is, there's formal party control, but actually management is in charge there. And management traditionally appoints the officials, either very explicitly or a little behind the scenes. Um, uh, the union here, the, the, the union is formally charged, its mission includes maintaining production. That is, stop strikes. Don't lead them. Don't use them. Um, and so um, that, but this is the only union workers are allowed to have. They are not allowed to organize their own union. Independent labor organizations that have any union-like features are harshly suppressed, and in anything that crosses the lines of the enterprise. So organizing within the enterprise, we'll talk about, there's, there's some toleration for that, but anything that goes beyond the enterprise is still pretty harshly repressed. So it's an official monopoly that is pretty assiduously maintained on the ground. So um, strikes have steadily risen since um, uh, they burst on the scene with the Honda strikes. And I want to you know, make the point that mass incidents is one thing. Strikes is a different thing. It um, has a very tangible impact on the economy and on the enterprises, but it also requires some organizing, and that's what makes it scary. Um, so strikes have risen steadily. All of those strikes are what we would call wildcat strikes. They are not authorized by the official 
uh, chosen representative of the workers. Um, so that is a very scary development. Um, so I want to step back now um, and, uh, oh, so here's just some pictures of strikes. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting that Ch Chinese workers often live on the factory premises, so they're often massing right outside the factory where they live and work. Um, so um, Foxconn, strike at Foxconn, that was, that was kind of electrifying, Foxconn being notorious for maintaining a sort of military-like control over its workforce. Um, all right, so uh, strikes have risen he steadily, but there's no official or uh, legitimate leadership for those strikes. And um, needless to say, worker citizens cannot mobilize politically for changing this system. Um, so it's pretty clear this story is not going to follow the U.S. New Deal trajectory in which independent unions were the central protagonists in achieving and then in implementing the reforms. Um, and that was gained largely through political mobilization from the bottom within a democratic electoral process. That's not what we're going to see. At the same time, workers are mobilizing and they are successfully pressuring the regime for some kinds of um, important reforms. So I want to um, now uh, step back and put oh, more strikes, more strikes, more strikes. Yeah, yep, yeah, all over the place. They're just proliferating. Uh, oh, but now here we are in Minneapolis in the 1930s. Um, so I want to put my comparative lens in focus a little bit. Um, so my reference, like I said, in, and I, the reference point for most of my readers, my audience, is the U.S. experience, um, especially the mid-20th century labor reforms um, of the New Deal period. So from the late 19th century to the Great Depression, you saw, and I'll show you some numbers soon, uh, rising labor unrest over wages, working conditions, the existing distribution of wealth and power in the society. Um, employers uh, successfully called upon the state and especially the courts to back them up in, this, in these conflicts. Um, we had government by injunction. The courts were striking down both labor standards legislation and legislation designed to promote collective bargaining. Um, the, the labor conflict after it dropped off during this period of repression to some extent, but every, all the conflict that was left became more politicized and more violent. And actually the U.S. across industrialized countries seems to have the history, the greatest history of violent confrontation in this um, uh, mid 20th century period. Um, and you had several citywide general strikes. I like showing this one particularly in China because it seems to be a, um, a possibly a Chinese immigrant worker standing side by side with the, um, uh, the uh, native born worker uh, leading this, uh, this particular general strike. Um, the sit-in strikes, we're talking about some of the most explosive kinds of labor conflict. Um, so, uh, but all of this together with mass political mobilization led by the Congress of uh, Industrial Organizations, the CIO, paved the way for the New Deal labor settlement, um, uh, which entailed primarily structural reforms enabling workers to collectivize their economic power, to engage in peaceful collective bargaining through um, admittedly still disruptive but not political or violent struggle. Um, and to do so through independent unions of their own choosing. Um, in addition, there was some modest regulation of labor standards. The Fair Labor Standards Act was um, a few years after the National Labor Relations Act. But the idea here was that industrial peace and stability um, required the legitimation and recognition um, of workers' chosen representatives um, and a framework for collective bargaining under the shadow of a legitimate protected strike threat. And that is exactly what many advocates, many worker advocates are claiming is needed in China now. Um, so the pattern, this pattern that I'm talking about is not really, is not confined to the U.S. Um, workers uh, everywhere pursue a better life at work 
um, through a combination of collective self-help and political mobilization. And most conflicts, um, and you'll see them across all, all countries, you're going to see a combination of rights conflicts or rights disputes. I'm not getting what I'm entitled to under either the law or contract. And interest disputes. I'm not getting what I think I deserve, what I think I am entitled to. Um, and if the existing um, tr processes for resolving those disputes are working, you have a, a sort of, you know, tolerable level of conflict that's going into the channels it should be going into. But if that doesn't happen, then uh, the ante may get raised to what I'm calling structural disputes. Like, we need better institutions. We need institutions that will allow us to resolve our ordinary bread and butter rights disputes and interest disputes. Um, and if the structural reforms are not forthcoming, can't be accommodated within the existing political system. Uh, well, so you, you hope that those structural disputes lead to uh, reinforcement of those uh, processes, but if not, you get political disputes. Politicization of labor conflict is was definitely happening in the U.S. in the 1930s, and it's the biggest fear of China now that labor disputes are going to mushroom into a more political challenge to the regime. Um, so uh, the structural industrial relations for reforms that swept through not just the U.S., but the Western democracies in the 20th century gave unions legitimacy, and the ability to advance workers' interests by collectivizing their economic power and by drawing it into peaceful um, and lawful channels. That only works if workers trust the union as their own, if they are willing to be led by the union, um, and if the union can actually achieve something for the workers. Otherwise, you get wildcat activity. Um, so the legitimation and regulation of independent unions in the U.S. Uh, allowed the government to step back from the front lines of labor conflict um, and uh, let that conflict be worked out within the unions, um, and it achieved a tolerable level of labor peace. Um, strike levels were still high, so um, this is a... Uh, a graphic depiction of the uh, in, of about a hundred years of uh, labor history in the U.S. We see this amazing spike in 1919, um, but things then, with a combination of repression and uh, a lot of repression, went down a, a big dip. Um, but then, in, in the, rep the the Depression, you start seeing a uh, rise in escalation, and things are. We have militant labor uh, leaders who are agitating for communism, socialism, uh, as well as simple, you know, reforms and collective bargaining. Um, the Wagner Act is passed in 1935, it isn't uh, validated by the Supreme Court, and people didn't expect it would be validated. So, this is the crucial time, 1937. Um, so, what happens then? Does it drop off? No, because uh, as you quintuple the number of union members, you also are going to get rising labor conflict. But these were different kinds of conflicts. These were not politicized in the same way, and they weren't violent. They were legitimized. They were protected by the system. They were disruptive, often very disruptive. And so um, that contributed to the enactment in 1947 of a fairly anti-labor set of amendments to the labor laws, which really put unions' feet to the fire and regulated the scope of their activities. Um, then, and there's two lines just because there's different, they started keeping the data in a different way. Then you really do see a pretty sharp drop-off during the relatively placid 1950s. The, you know, we have the Cold War setting in. We have a retreat to a different kind of uh, less militant unionism. And then you have another spike in the late 60s, early 70s, where everybody all over the world was agitating, right? And then what happens? Okay, so we're going to come back to that last part of the story. Um, but especially after 1947, Unions clearly became the primary frontline regulators of workers. Um, workers' collective activity was not regulated directly by the government, by the courts, by the police. That was, that was a disaster. It was being regulated in effect through this sort of democratic process within the unions. 
Um, so government regulates the unions and the unions regulate the workers. Um, China's leaders are very aware of this story. Um, they would like to emulate the results many of the results of our New Deal um, labor reforms um, to the extent that contributed to industrial and political stability, a renewal of political legitimacy on the part of the government, which now represented all the people, um, uh, economic, greater economic equality, prosperity, growth, all that good stuff, while avoiding the industrial turmoil and mass political mobilization that actually brought it about. Um, so, uh, and in particular, while avoiding the rise of an independent labor movement. So that's the dilemma that China faces. Independent unions help to bring order to industrial unrest um, by channeling it into constructive institutional um, channels uh, and deploying the threat of unrest to actually achieve concessions without having to go on strike. China is far more willing to tolerate disorganized unrest than organized mobilization. Um, and so they're in a little bit of a trap. Um, and that has powerfully shaped their response to labor unrest um, I basically ended up looking at a bunch of facets of, um, oh yeah, we'll get there. I ended up uh, looking at a bunch of facets of China's response to labor unrest and um, developed, found a, a recurring theme which became the thesis of the book. China's response to labor unrest, both the reform part of it and the repression part of it, um, are both driven and constrained by um, an unyielding commitment to avoiding the rise of an independent labor movement. Um, that unyielding commitment comes from the regime's own study of history. So here we get to this. In Western democracies, certainly, um, including the U.S., in post-Soviet societies like Poland, also in East Asian societies like South Korea and uh, Taiwan, independent trade unions have often been leading um, uh, proponents and leading mobilizers on behalf of democratization and regime change. Um, especially salient and alarming to the Chinese um, uh, leaders was the developments in Poland. So a grassroots independent trade union, Solidarity, um, spearheaded the movement for democracy in that country that brought down the Communist Party and led to free elections. Um, the first round of elections um, that uh, ended up displacing the Communist Party occurred on a date that might sound familiar. June 4th, 1989. What else happened on June 4th, 1989? In Tiananmen Square, um, Mostly students, but worker organizations, autonomous worker organizations were starting to flow in in support of the students. And it wasn't just in Beijing. This, is, this was the center of it, but it was an, uh, an uprising on behalf of rights and democratization. Um, that's the famous tank picture, the man in front of the tank. And that's what it looked like by the end of June 4th, 1989. Um, that was, came to be seen um, as the moment when everything could have been lost and that should never be allowed to happen again. Uh, and that the party is now largely unified around the commitment to maintaining the stability of China's one-party rule in part by um, squelching independent collective action and organizing anything that is or threatens to become political. Um, so that an independent labor mobilization in particular is seen as an existential threat to that stability. And that guides every facet of China's response to labor unrest. So it guides first the use of repression. Um, they are perfectly willing, they have all the tools they need, um, repression of independent work, worker organizing, especially across factories, but it also guides constraints on that repression. In other words, we don't want to inflame the situation through uh, excessive use of repression. We have to find other ways of dealing with unrest. So target 
the agents of contagion and just kind of keep the rest at a very low simmer. But then a reform response was also required, and so you see both reforms and um, ad hoc concessions um, on the, you know, in the moment that try to address workers' concerns, that try to raise labor standards, um, improve avenues for resolution of disputes, but it also constrains those reforms. Um, and that's seen across a, vi a wide variety of areas. So I'm going to talk about a couple of them just briefly. So on the regulatory response to labor unrest, stronger labor rights and um, better access to remedies is part of the regime's effort to address workers' concerns, uh, stem the tide of labor disputes, draw workers off the streets and into the official tribunals. And that was their first choice. That that's how they would have liked to solve the problem of labor unrest, and that was the subject of the 2007 uh, legislation. But enforcement of labor rights requires independent, effective representation of workers um, by zealous advocates, lawyers, um, other advocacy organizations, unions, if they're willing and able to play that role. Um, in China, as in the U.S., uh, unions aren't doing that job. Um, they're not helping low-wage workers. They're not doing enough to help low-wage workers address their, um, uh, to enforce their rights. Um, uh, and um, government-funded legal aid falls far short of addressing this problem. Um, so uh, workers need help. They need other independent advocates, lawyers, NGOs. But in China, advocates who represent workers in these rights claims you might think that's a very innocuous kind of um, activity, but they are seen as potential catalysts of group action, um, organizing outside the official system of uh, worker representation. That's especially true of NGOs um, and lawyers who try to maintain their independence from um, the government or the party. And it's especially true of advocates who pursue unorthodox, unorthodox claims like, for example, sex discrimination, um, or collective claims, because many rights disputes are collective claims. Um, so the harassment of unofficial pressure and harassment in the sort of narrow space that's allowed for these unofficial worker advocates contributes to a very large representation gap, a gap between uh, what workers need by way of representation to actually enforce the rights the law says they have and the, rep the representatives who are willing to step forward and able to help workers. Um, and so that means that unresolved uh, collective rights disputes have been a continuing source of labor unrest, including the largest strike in China's recent history at Yue Yuan. Uh, 30 to 40,000 workers uh, struck chiefly over, initially over missing um, uh, social insurance contributions. They found out that the employer wasn't doing what it's supposed to do according to the law, and that triggered this gigantic strike that spread, and this is the, the thing that really scares them, it spread across multiple factories. So the, um, the UAUN strike, this gigantic strike, illustrates why even rights disputes, the, the, even just the assertion of rights that the government concedes and in principle wants to be enforced, um, are potentially threatening to the regime. Because many rights disputes um, are collective by nature, and um, they can often trigger wider disputes, often with the government as a target. So those uncollected social, security, social insurance contributions, it was a, a collaboration between the company and the government officials who weren't collecting the money that they were supposed to be. So the government becomes a target this is a very um, so 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 they're they're alarmed even by uh, collective advo advocacy in within the official rights system. Um, uh, another, I'm just putting the same slide back up. Another example is in movement to reform the official union. This seems like an obvious target, right? Um, uh, the official party, the official union is party dominated and at the enterprise level, management dominated. It is often described by workers as useless. Uh, they do not view the union as their own, as loyal to them. They don't choose their, their union officers. Um, and official, the, the, an official union, a union that doesn't uh, 
uh, represent workers and isn't seen as representing workers can't regulate workers. So if you want the union to play a role in actually regulating unrest, the, worker ha the, the union has to be seen as the collective agent of the workers. Um, and so that has generated a push, um, not the first time, for direct elections. And so we're, what are we talking about? Direct elections of who? The whole union structure? Oh, no. The enterprise union. The, so... Um, the tar management control became seen as a problem. Not willing to give up party control of everything above the enterprise level, but we are willing to give up management control through direct elections, um, direct and more democratic, and the, you know, the, the array of procedures that affect the dem democraticness of elections is obviously vast. Um, but there were some signs in um, 2010, 2012, uh, striking workers were demanding not just higher wages, they were demanding elections. They were demanding freer elections in which they get to choose their own candidates. Um, uh, sometimes they were getting that as part of the give and take in a strike, uh, you know, better than the alternative of ongoing um, agitation. Um, and that uh, one widely celebrated example at um, Ohm's Electronic, a, a comparatively direct and comparatively democratic election procedure. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about it. There's been pilot projects. There's been discussion about it. Um, although, again, only at the bottom most level, of, um, at the um, enterprise level. But there's also a huge amount of anxiety and hesitation about it. So managers, um, higher level trade union officials, uh, the party officials, um, are fearful that too much democracy, too much responsiveness um, uh, is dangerous. Uh, it could get out of hand. It could get out of control. Um, it could become a catalyst for independent activism. The workers might choose hotheads. They might choose militants. Um, they might choose irresponsible leaders who might actually stir up unrest, might actually take them out on strike. That's not what we want unions to do. Um, and so that fear has largely suffocated this reform. There's all There are very, very few instances where the um, uh, party where the, the, the official rules uh, allow workers to nominate their own candidates. The party and management maintain control over who the candidates can be. Then there might be an election, but the, it's an election among pre-approved um, candidates. Um, and so very little progress in actually making the union accountable to, answerable to the workers. So um, again, the fear of, fear of uh, independent mobilization crimps the reform that might actually help you get a better handle on uh, rising labor unrest. Um, so in the leadership vacuum that um, exists obviously here, there's been some brave activists who've stepped forward, um, try to help striking workers figure out how to elect their own leaders um, in a strike situation, how to formulate demands, how to engage in collective bargaining, how to figure out what the workers actually want. Um, to shape disorganized chaos into um, a relatively organized and peaceful bargaining situation. Um, so um, here are three of the um, most active of those independent labor leaders. Um, Duany is a lawyer. The others are non-lawyer um, advocates. Um, the fact that I personally know all three of these people should be a message. These are three of the most prominent people. I know all three of them, and you know, it's not like I know everybody, right? Uh, this is a tiny, tiny group of people, and all three of these individuals have been brought to heel in one way or another. Um, I believe that uh, Zhang Feiyang is still in jail, still in detention. Uh, Zhang Juru has been in, de in and out of detention multiple times. Duan Yi, who has um, uh, relatives in the Beijing you know, leadership compound, uh, has been treated better, um, but he's basically been told, lay off. And you can't you can't travel and, and make your speeches uh, abroad anymore. Um, okay, so um, uh, the crackdown. There's a, there was a big crackdown on rights lawyers and independent labor activists in 2015, 16, and that shows that the um, the regime can still muster a blunt force response uh, with no judicial pushback. Uh, but there still is relatively little um, police violence or arrests of ordinary strikers. Uh, that would risk a backlash, that would risk escalation, that would risk inflaming the situation. Um, the harshest repression is saved for those who are who show up in multiple strike situations and are seen as agents of contagion. 
Um, all right, so um, I'm happy to talk about any of those moving parts or some of the others um, that I've talked about, but let's get to the question posed by the book title. Um, will China's workers get a new deal? If that means basic democratizing structural reform of industrial relations institutions, I think the answer is pretty clearly no. But let's rephrase the question. Can China's leaders keep labor unrest from seriously derailing political stability and economic growth without making basic structural um, reforms? So one huge caveat to anything I can say about this, if the economy implodes, as some uh, observers think it might, um, all bets are off. Otherwise, let's look at two very, oh, yeah, there you got it again. Oh, twice. Okay, two very oblique sets of data. Um, first question, how serious is China's labor unrest problem as compared to the problem the U.S. faced in the 1930s in the lead up to the New Deal? This is a, you know, this, any number of ways of looking at this and trying to do it through numbers is extremely perilous. So with lots of apologies about the quality of the data here, um, here's what you've got uh, in China um, in the last several years. Uh, like uh, most years in this short period, labor unrest has doubled. But look at the axis on the left. So doubled up to 0.09% of what? Of the working age population. This is, okay, why that? It's the best I could get that I could compare to the U.S. Um, uh, so um, now I changed the left-hand axis, right? So um, now it, go, it goes up a lot higher. It had to to accommodate the U.S. This is as a percentage of the working age population. So China at the highest level it's reached so far is well under half of the lowest level, um, which I think was 1930 um, in this pre-New Deal period. Now, you can say a lot of things about this. Uh, things can change fast. They did in the U.S., right? Um, and it's amazing that China's workers have mobilized and, and been able to organize strikes as much as they have, given that they don't have any above-board leadership that can actually help them do that. Um, also, clearly, authoritarian governments are much more vulnerable. They have, they have a lot less resilience to this kind of unrest than democratic governments might have. Um, still... This suggests to me that there's a, they have a long way to go before it gets to the level of intensity that um, was experienced as uh, uh, making absolutely mandatory these reforms in the U.S. Stated differently, I think China, um, chi China's government figures that it can play whack-a-mole. You know whack-a-mole? We can deal with one outburst at a time, we can do that for a very long time. As long as we can successfully whack down the moles that are, make, are, are possible agents of contagion, we can do this for a long time. We can tolerate these individual outbursts for a good long time, and we're going to do that for a good long time before we make the kind of massively democratizing reforms that many labor activists think they ought to be making. Um, but second uh, set of data... Think about what um, China's leaders see here and now in the U.S. You know, it's not like uh, the 2000s that anything's going to unfold like it did back in the 30s. Things change. And what, what happened to us in the last several decades? We now have the lowest strike levels in 100 years. Probably more, but that's all the data we have. Um, we have, in, in essence, labor peace with only minimal, only a minimal presence of independent unions and collective bargaining. Uh, we have, uh, I would call it perhaps, the peace of the graveyard. Um, and what's died is not only the collective bargaining model for industrial relations, but a major mechanism for economic equality. So I think China's leaders are thinking, why can't we just go from that really, really low level back in 1930 straight to 
what they have now without going through all that turmoil and unrest. Can't we just skip that phase? I don't know, but I am not sure they can't. How's that for a conclusion? <laughs> all right, I'd be happy to take some questions. Oh, somebody. I have, shirt. I, have, I have a question about the first to last part, the one that was showing the percentage between China and... Oh, uh, yeah, there's lots of questions about that. <laughs> yeah, with this, does this, this take into account the uh, like China's population differential with yeah, the United this is, States? Yeah, this is per capita. This is per capita. So, um, and it, you know, that took some doing, but it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, you, you do ask all sorts of questions about it, the relative urban or rural, there's lots of things you can ask about it. But it is meant it's certain happening.
Europe, they used to uh, from a rural part of the China. <laughs> and, and now they have uh, uh, moved to the cities. And you will see that young, um, uh, the younger generations, they come to, they go to the, world, uh, the factories to, to become workers. Now you have uh, people born in after 2000, mm -hmm. they start to work in these factories. Mm -hmm. You may see, I don't know if you read the novel uh, Factory Girls. Yes. So, so I, I just wonder, um, what do you think about this male generation? So a um, lot's been written about this. So you had from, from poor rural peasants who really just wanted to save enough to, to go back to their um, little plot of land um, or send money back. You have people who, they're not going back, right? They're, they're pretty much, they want to be rural, uh, urban residents. So that's one of the things. You have, these are people who have um, were born into the, a lot of them were into the one child generation. Um, that has made some changes in both overall labor market, you know, forces and individual uh, forces. But people have become much more demanding. If you're no longer, if your choice is no longer between rural starvation and the best factory job you can get, but rather you've got a bunch of different factory jobs, and back there in your, uh, in, you know, you're in the interior, development is coming there too. And so uh, the flow of migrant workers, they're not so willing to put up with everything. They're not so willing to, to give up everything at home and um, tolerate whatever happens to be thrown at them. So you have very high turnover rates. You have workers who feel entitled to be treated as actual citizens. Um, and that is in part what you see, I think that contributes in some ways to the growing um, collective sense of entitlement and demands and agitation and ability to organize. On the other hand, there are people who point to um, a sort of growing materialism um, and individualism. <coughs> um, uh, and that eventually could end up cutting the other way. Like, okay, I'm just to take care of myself. Um, you know, if I don't like it here, I'll go someplace else. Um, so those two things are, I think, kind of competing with each other in terms of uh, determining the future of Willingness to go out on a limb for collective mobilization. That's some, you know, we've seen changes in the U.S. too. Part of that declining strike level is a very different cultural attitude toward how much of my fate is my own and how much is tied up with my coworkers and people of my uh, my occupational group. Um, and that is, I think, we're starting to see some of that happening as well. All right, let's see some going. One green. You also. Uh, thanks. Uh, take, taking your thesis that an effective system of collective bargaining is a substitute for <coughs> political turmoil or workers' happiness and things like that, in some ways the United States and China are in very similar positions right now. I mean, we neither one of us has a, a, a workable system of collective bargaining. And in the United States, you could argue that that's like some of our political turmoil, where, where, the, where the establishment candidates have had trouble Either, either winning their primaries and, and becoming the candidate or, or, or closing up the election. Whereas in China, uh, the lack of effective collective bargaining has led to these work stoppages. Yeah. And the question, I mean, that in, in China, in some ways, the solution is more obvious. You need to give workers some greater say within the Communist Party. If you're going to have a unitary system, uh, it should reflect, and, and the problem is, is that workers aren't have enough say in, in how the workplaces are run or whatever. They, they need to more, have more say in, in the Communist Party. In the United States, I guess the argument is, that workers need to have more say within our our democratic process. Yeah. So, what do you, so we, we, you think about that? We're kind of in, in very different positions yeah. in that there's no problem with labor unrest in this country. You know, the things you read about in the paper, you know, people like you and me get very excited about fight for 15. It's nothing. It's nothing compared to the kind of you know mass uprising that that we've had in our history. Um, and so the push to address these problems is not there in the U.S. as it is in China. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that mic away from you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but, but what about the political turmoil? Yeah, but, but you're right. Uh, you know, States, uh, exactly uh, dissatisfaction happened. comes out in different ways. Yeah. It comes out in morale. It comes out in political disgruntlement. It does come out in different ways. Now, um, whose interests are being served there? That does not necessarily lead 
to a unified elite recognition that we need to actually make things better. So we'll talk more about this. Yeah, so my question goes back to whenever, you know, there's that informed system that whenever there is a strike, they have to go find them. You can't work in the shadow of the strike. Um, so is there a form? So in the U.S., you know, employers can just say, fine, forget you guys that are striking. We're going to bring in replacements. Um, is there a similar process in China, or do they find that to be, you know, since they want to keep production going, it's easier to go find the informal person and get the people back in since yeah. they're living on campus? Very interesting question. Um, that is obviously part of what's killed the strike in the U.S., the ability to permanently replace strikers. Um, uh, I am not aware of companies attempting to permanently replace, or, or frankly replace strikers, period, in China. And one reason for it is that, um, like I said, the strikes and the, the, these masses of people that you see, they're like right there. And so those workers in the U.S. would be trespassing. They could be kept out and their numbers can be regulated. They can't mass at the actual factory, you know, the workplace gates. And so I think that's part of the reason that you just haven't seen um, uh, much action. Down the line, you know, you, if you started getting an actual like system for dealing with strikes, you know, that's something that they'll want to pay attention to. And back again. As, uh, as wages and labor conditions improve in China, it will no longer be winning the race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So what effect will it have when companies can outsource, are better off outsourcing to Southeast Asia instead? Excellent question. So um, remember my race to the rising bottom. The bottom is rising. China has risen up. Labor is not so cheap in China anymore. And so you see that the industries that initially fueled China's rise, which is low skill, um, a labor-intensive um, textile, apparel, shoes, toys, uh, cheap electronics, stuff like that. Those have a large, a lot of that has moved. Sometimes it's moved into the interior of China, um, and sometimes it's moved into uh, uh, Bangladesh or other parts of Southeast Asia. Absolutely right. Um, and to a certain, to, to a great extent, that's good for China. China wants that. They want to rise up. They don't want to be the factory of the world. They don't want to be the cheap labor center of the world. They want to be rising up. But what I think is actually, I didn't say a word about it here, but what I think is the biggest threat to China is actually um, automation. So Foxconn employs, I think, literally uh, like a million workers in China. Just one company. It's a Taiwanese company. And it's notorious. It produces like most of the iPads and iPhones and, and lots of other brands as well. Uh, notorious for this militaristic control. Well, okay, Foxconn's getting strikes now. Um, and um, I just, my jaw just dropped, and my heart dropped, and China's did too, I suspect, when you read that uh, Foxconn was investing something like a billion dollars in robotics. So you think, we're used, we're kind of used to the idea that robots may be cheaper than US workers. That's why the factories that are coming back are highly automated. But the idea that robots are cheaper and more reliable and less troublemaking, right, than Chinese workers should be terrifying to all of us. So that's my next project, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're out of time, right? Please join me in thanking you. Thank you.